Thank you, Pastor Stockton, and good evening, church family. You know, it was a good day today, a blessing to have visitors with us, and had a wonderful time, uh, lunch with uh, my friend, his wife, and then your pastor came with as well, and, um, you know, been around for a while, been uh, saved for over 40 years. I'm 62 years old, uh, saved, I guess, for 40-some years then. I got saved when I was 18. And uh, it's a blessing to see how the Lord builds his church. And you all went through a tough time and just a blessing to see who he's brought to you and your pastor and his wife and uh, family. And be grateful for that. Amen. You say, well, I love the congregation. Well, Jesus loves it more. Amen. And uh, he's a debtor to no man. He'll guard it and guide it. And it's been a blessing uh, to see you stay faithful to the truth in the midst of, of uh, just uh, some struggles. And we appreciate that very, very much. Special shout out to Brother Jim Hackendorf, the other Brother Dorf. He's probably tuned in right now. And uh, Brother Jim, we're praying for you. We appreciate you. And uh, Jennifer as well. And just praying for a speedy recovery. Uh, they say it's not supposed to be, but... Uh, that's not the great physician. That's just a physician. So we're praying for a speedier recovery. Amen. And then we'll be praying for John as well. John Loveless and all there. Real quickly, I do want to mention, go by and see my wife afterwards. Pick up a ministry newsletter. We have a full color ministry newsletter. And then ladies, if you've not, never availed yourself of her book, she has two out now. And uh, <laughs> she's a taskmaster. She's got me editing a third one also. And, uh, and these things have been a great, great help. And so if you'd like to get one, see Deb, and uh, I think it'll be a great help. It's hard to find good literature today and uh, good writing. I, I know the author very personally. I can vouch for her. Uh, I know every time I edit those things, I come under conviction. <laughs> so uh, maybe she's writing them just for that reason. I don't know. But uh, there's a blessing there. And to see her afterwards, if you'd like one. Take your Bibles. Let's go to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. I'll let you remain seated. I found it interesting. These were uh, many of the thoughts. This series was on my heart a long time ago for you as a church family. And then I found out your pastor is going through the book of first, books of First and Second Peter. And both he and I were just commenting on this the other day. We say that those are two of the richest books of the Bible. They are just rich. You know, Peter, when you look at Peter, Peter was a rascal. You know, Peter was no disciple. No apostle was corrected more than Peter by the Lord, you know. And no apostle ever corrected the Lord except Peter. I mean, he was a squirrel, you know. But he finished so well. He finished so well. And uh, we see how God changed this individual. And through him brought us these two rich, rich letters. Uh, these two rich epistles to you and me. Notice, I want to look in verse number 13. You know, 1 Peter chapter 1, and look at what's said here in 1 Peter 1. We tap this in Sunday school. In verse number 13, he says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. This morning we looked at an incorruptible salvation that we have through the person of Jesus Christ. But tonight I want to look at an unmistakable command that the Spirit of God through Peter gives every one of us that knows Jesus Christ as Savior. And that unmistakable command in verse 16, be ye holy, for I am holy says our Father. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you tonight for, again, the honor to be in your house and with your people. Thank you for a good day today as your word has gone forth and sown into the hearts of individuals. We rest on the promise that it will not return void, but you will prosper it, Lord. Bring forth fruit. And now, Lord, as we come to you, we do pause to ask that you be with Brother Hackendorf. And we just pray, lift him up to you, pray that you would heal him, restore him to health, and for John Loveless, Lord, that you would alleviate some of the pain. We know that suffering is part of this life, but we do ask specifically for these two things. And Lord, we pray that your hand would be upon these men. Now bless our service tonight. Challenge us with this truth, this unmistakable command to be holy as you are holy. 
Apply it to our hearts and help us not to be hearers only. May your Holy Spirit prompt us to be doers of thy word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. An unmistakable command. Notice with me, he says again in verse number 15, But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. As we look across America tonight, you and I need to recognize that everything that you and I would deem to be true is being turned upside down. And that we're no longer being preserved, but there's decay everywhere. Somebody once said when it comes to cultures and people and nations that the final sin of a decaying culture is the sin of tolerance. And I look across our land and I see what's being tolerated today that should never be tolerated. But then I look in churches. I get that unique perspective as I travel, Deb and I, 35 states every year. And many, many churches from cities to towns to countryside were in them all. And it sometimes is shocking for me to see what God's people are willing to tolerate spiritually and absolutely unwilling to terminate personally. First Peter here in chapter 1 brings our attention to how God wants us to live now that we belong to him. And we see that command. He says, be ye holy for I am holy. But it's not just there. Look in 2 Peter chapter 1 and notice with me, he shares it again in verse number 3. In 2 Peter 1, in verse number 3, he notes the divine power that's given to every one of us that's saved. And notice how it works. In 2 Peter 1, verse 3, he says, According as his divine power hath given us unto us all things that pertain unto what? Not only life, but look at this, also unto godliness. All right? So godliness is brought up. And then if you go to chapter 3 in 2 Peter, verse 11, they both get tied together. Notice in chapter 3, 2 Peter 3, 11, the Spirit of God through Peter says, Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and, what's the word? Godliness. Here we see this unmistakable command is reconfirmed twice more in these two epistles. And I see something here, holiness and godliness, write that word in your notes, are essentially one in the same. Holiness and godliness are essentially one in the same. Holiness defined, I gave it to you, it's a state of being holy. <laughs> That's pretty simple, isn't it? It's purity or integrity of moral character. It's freedom from sin. It's moral soundness. But godliness defined is piety and reverence to God to his character and his laws. It's a careful observance of the laws of God that leads to obedience. There seems to be one that leans toward attitude, and the other one seems to lean toward your activity. What does godliness mean? Well, it literally means God-likeness, to be like God, to think like God. Write this in your notes, to have his character. Isn't that interesting? I mean, holiness and godliness, they're practically synonymous. Godliness means God-likeness. It means to think and act like God, to literally have his character. And I would be the first to say tonight, just pause and think about that. That's kind of a big thought. That, that's kind of up there, you know, to think like God, to act like God. I mean, you know, that's pretty big. So God brings this high thought down to us in a very practical way. Look with me in 1 Timothy, and look at how he does this in 1 Timothy chapter 3. In 1 Timothy chapter, two, chapter 3, he brings this big thought to be like God down to where we can understand it. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, look at what he says here in, in verse Verse number 16, he says this, 1 Timothy 3, 16, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Uh, you know, I mean, this big thought to be God-likeness, to be like God. And then he goes to say this, here's the mystery revealed. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. What does that tell us? 
To be godly is to be like Jesus Christ. Boom, now we have it. Amen? To be like Jesus Christ. This is God manifest in the flesh. God, God humbled himself, became a man. And you say, well, God wants me to act like him, think like him, live like him. Well, he brings that down to a visual in the person of Jesus Christ. There's the mystery of godliness manifested to you and me to be like Jesus Christ. And that's not a bad statement. When you come into these decisions in your life, well, what would Jesus do? Amen? There it is. What he do, would do, you should do. How he speaks, you should speak. This is godliness. This is godlikeness. This is manifested in the person of Jesus Christ. Go to Hebrews with me and look at how he's further described here. To be godly is to be like Jesus Christ. Go to Hebrews with me, chapter 7, and, and, and look at this description of Jesus Christ. If you can describe him, then you will wrap your arms around the God-likeness that God wants you and me to possess and how we're to live and act. How, how do we describe the Savior? Well, he's described in Hebrews 7, and look at what's said in verse number 26. Hebrews 7, 26 says, For such an high priest became us. There's, there's God manifest in flesh. Look at, here's who he is. Who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. Write those in there. You know, if you could describe Jesus Christ, he, he is described here in Hebrews 7. He's number one, holy. Number two, he's harmless. Number three, he's undefiled. Number four, he's separate from sinners. And number five, he's higher than the heavens. I find this interesting because when you and I see those descriptions, I wonder, would that be our description? Would somebody say, this is who you are? The word I kind of key on a little bit here is harmless. All right? My wife is fond of, as we discuss things, we've, we've discussed various of our children their spouses, sorry, Josiah, you're in the mix, you joined the family, you are now target as well as all the rest of us. But it's funny to listen to Deb talk, because there'll be times where, where she'll say, Laura Lynn, Laura Lynn is my, what do you call her? My golden retriever. Now, Laura Lynn married our oldest son, Kevin, and she's my golden retriever. That's what she calls her. You know, she's happy. She's kind of harmless. You know, and she's a golden retriever. And, and I said, well, that's neat. And she'll go through and she'll actually, I don't remember what she called you, Josiah, but, but she just, she goes through, you know, and she, you know, she tries to, she tries to make these things become visual. And then you, you know, you hear this and you go, that's neat. And then you make the, the awful mistake. Whoa, who am I? <laughs> You don't want an honest answer, never ask the question. <laughs> I think she said something like this. You're kind of a cross between a German shepherd and a pit bull, you know. Ooh, uh, that's not good, is it? She never said anything. That's an answer, all right? <laughs> you know, I wonder if you were described as somebody said, you know, that person, when I hear their name, I think of this. What would they think of? Would you be thought of holy? harmless. You know, that's fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace. You know what I mean? You don't take a bite out of somebody every time you get a shot at it, you know. Separated, living a higher life, not a lower life. That ought to be our reputation, amen? So as we look at this thought tonight, you and I need to recognize that we have a calling on our life, and we notice here that God wants us to be holy. It's an unmistakable command. You hear the name of Jesus, and you think of some things. And when someone hears your name, they should think of similar things in your life. They should think of the Savior when they think of you. Amen? Turn your notes over because I want to go back and I want to just show you the four commands God gives you and me. I think this is going to help us. This helps me. God wants me to be holy. God wants me to be like him. In other words, to live like Jesus Christ. And he gives four commands. You see them? They're tucked in there in 1 Peter chapter 1. 
And the, in verse number 13, he gives the first of four commands concerning godliness and holiness. Look at the first command in verse 13. He says, wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. His first command to you and me is gird up. That's an interesting thought. Gird up what? The loins of your mind. You know, you look over, you go back in history and you look at the Roman soldiers and how they, how they prepared for battle. And every one of them had a large leather belt. And the very last thing they would do before they would charge into the battle is they would tuck everything loose in that belt. Whatever garments were dangling, what, they would tuck everything loose in there and they'd give one last cinch to tighten it all up so there was nothing loose they could trip and fall on or get entangled in in the midst of the battle. You know what the Lord's saying? Tighten up your thought life. That's what he's saying. You want to live a holy life and you want to be like Jesus Christ? Then you guard your heart, you guard your mind, you tighten up, gird up the loins of your mind. Philippians 4, 8 says, Finally, brethren, what sort of things are true? What sort of things are honest? What sort of things are just? What sort of things are pure? What sort of things are lovely? What sort of things are good report? If there be any virtue and if there be any praise, then think on these things. Gird up, tighten up the thought life. I like what he says, and you might want to write this down in 2 Corinthians 10, 5. He says this, he says, bringing into captivity every thought. Captivity, I mean, girding it up, cinching it down. Every thought to the obedience of Jesus Christ. I wrote this in my notes. Loose thinking always leads to loose living. Every time. We get tripped up and fall. And so he says, the first command, gird up. Tighten up the thought life, amen? Don't let your mind just go wherever it wants to go. You, you tighten that thing up because we are in a battle. And Satan is still an adversary. But number two, he says, look up. Look at me, verse 13. Notice, he says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the, re for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He says, first of all, gird up the loins of your mind, but then he says, look up. He says, have the proper focus. Now, I want you to fill this blanking because this is, this is very profound, but I find it so true in my life. True and mature Christianity focuses on the future. It's a heavenly focus. The mature Christian is looking up. The mature Christian is looking to the end of time in that eternal rendezvous with their Savior. Are you with me? But carnal Christianity and lost people focus on the present. They have an earthly focus, not a heavenly focus. What's your focus tonight? I mean, it's a Sunday night. I would imagine most of you are here because you're serious about the Lord, you know. Uh, but is your focus really there? Or maybe you're a young person, you say, yeah, if I were to say, why are you here? Well, Dad made me come. You know, well, that's good. That's a good start. And frankly, between you and me, if I, if I did everything only when I felt like doing it, I probably wouldn't be that spiritual. Sometimes we just do things because it's right. And along the way, you know, the emotions follow. But I wonder tonight, what is your focus? Look at this, this thought. I wrote again, true Christianity focuses on the future. It has a heavenly look. And carnal Christianity and lost people focus on the present. It has an earthly look. Look with me in Galatians 1. Notice how the Spirit of God through Paul shows us this. Go to Galatians 1 with me very quickly. I'm just, <coughs> I'm just going to give you a few verses here in Galatians 1. And notice what's said here in verse number 3. Galatians 1 and verse number 3. I want to just jot these down. I didn't put them in your notes. We're commanded to gird up, but then, Christian, you're commanded, and I'm commanded to look up. Have a heavenly focus, not an earthly focus. Look at what's said in Galatians 1, verse 3. Grace be to you, and peace from God the Father, and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at this. Who gave himself for our sins. Why? That he might deliver us from what? This present evil world. Notice, he, he didn't die for us to go ahead and give us the world. He died for us 
to deliver us from this world. And he notes it's a present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. Isn't that interesting? Notice the believers aren't looking at the world. We're being delivered from it to another world. Look with me in, in uh, I'll just quote this one. Proverbs 17, 24 says this, A fool's eyes are where? In the ends of the earth. Proverbs 17, 24. A fool's eyes are in the ends of the earth. It's not an upward focus. It's now. It's just this life. Look at with me in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We're told and commanded not only to gird up, but we're to look up. We're to have the proper focus. Look in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 18. Talks about how we faint not in verse 16, our light affliction, verse 17. And look at verse 18. What's the focus of a believer? While we look not at the things which are seen. That's the earth. That's everything down here. But at the things which are not seen. That's the heavenly things. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen, those are eternal. And then finally, go to Colossians 3 and look with me. Colossians 3, very clear command. We know this one well. In Colossians 3, in verse number 1, notice what's said here. It says in Colossians 3, 1, If ye then be risen with Christ, there's that positional truth. Colossians 3, 1, If ye then be risen with Christ, what are you supposed to do? Seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Notice mature Christianity their focus is not this world. Their focus is the next one. They have an upward gaze as they go through life down here. Man, I sang it this morning. This world's not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. If, if we're risen with Christ, we're to be having an upward look, not a downward look. We live so much, I wrote this down, with a focus on the future that our present actions and decisions are governed by that focus. I'm going to say that again. We live so much as believers with a focus on the future that all of our actions and all of our attitudes and decisions right now are governed by that focus. A classic example. When you propose to your wife, brother, when you and your wife, you're, you proposed and then she accepted your proposal, do you know that everything you did from that moment forward was influenced by the future wedding day? Amen? Is that not right? I think of when I proposed to Deb, Astoria, Oregon. I came down at one year out of the Marine Corps. I, I proposed to her and she didn't say yes right away. Nope. I said, will you marry me? She said, well, one condition. I thought, oh boy. What's that? Well, Jesse has to come with. Jesse was her dog. I said, that's a small dowry to cough up. I can take a dog with. And so I said, no problem. Jesse can come with. But you know what's interesting? After she accepted my proposal, suddenly this thought came to me. Whoa, I need to get a better job. Amen. At the time, I was visitation minister for the church. Me and another kid, one of the pastor's son, knocked doors eight hours a day, five days a week. And we split the $1 bills that came in the offering every Sunday. Came out to about 56 bucks a piece. 56 bucks a piece. I think the pastor's wife threw some $1 bills in there just to make sure we had something. <laughs> Miss Joan. And I remember after she said yes, and I go back to Alaska, I go, now, wait a minute. Living with the Agnew family, that's probably not going to keep going this way. I was a semi-adopted son, you know. So overhead was zeroed out to 56 bucks a week I could do. But, man, I'm picking up a wife and a dog. And now, I, I you know, 56 bucks, bucks a week. I don't even think I need to calculate that one. I don't think that's going to be enough. Man, I begin to look for a place. I begin to look for another job. You know what I'm saying? I, I mean, suddenly, because there was this future meeting, this future relationship that I was going to have with this young lady, everything about that future date controlled everything I did then. Getting the home ready, getting the job, getting everything prepared. That future date controlled how I lived and acted now. 
And while I was doing all that, you know what she was doing? Because every woman has one. Every bride-to-be has a hope chest. Right? And, and that hope chest, you put things in there for that future home, right? You're going to have a home, so you put things in there. You can only put so much in there. I mean, you couldn't just put anything in there. It had to be valuable things in there, you know? And every, as, as I'm preparing for that future day, she is too. It became an obsession. We're getting married. We need to be ready. And let me remind you, there's coming a day where you and I are going to meet our Savior. There's a future day. There's a consummation of this entire relationship. And you and I don't want to stand before him ashamed. We want to stand before him and hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And you have a hope chest and I have a hope chest. It's our heart. What you put in there? What's in the hope chest of your heart? Is it something that needs to be there when you meet your Savior? Or is it something that shouldn't be there? An attitude. Y'all with me? There's only so much room. Your heart needs to be filled with the things that are pleasing to that Savior you're going to meet one day. Right now. And that future rendezvous should affect how we live right now. Amen? Gird up the loins of your mind. Tighten up the thought life. But second of all, look up to that future date. It affects how you live now. Everything about that future date should affect you and me and how we're living right now. I wrote this down. Staying clean today has a lot to say about what we're planning to do tomorrow. Amen. But then thirdly, go back. Look with me. He gives a third command in 1 Peter chapter 1. He, he says, gird up the loins of your mind and then look up to the revelation of Jesus Christ this is where it's all heading. It's heading to a rendezvous with Jesus Christ. But then thirdly, he commands us to grow up. Look at what he says in verse 14. He, and just pick it up for context. Verse 13, wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children. Not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. Here we see the third command. It's inferred. Grow up. Grow up. You know, as you look at this command, could I just remind you, obedience is to be expected. You can write that in your notes. You know, the day you entered your Heavenly Father's household, He has an expectation of obedience on every one of His children. Obedience to our Father should never be an option. Amen? You, you know, every time I, I just, I, I went through a family conference last week in Dayton, Ohio, and uh, when we get to the child rearing, I, I just always say this. Obedience needs to be expected in your home. Every child should be trained to obey. Period. But mine, no, yours is no exception. Every child should be trained to obey. And let me tell you something. Your home, obedience should be expected. And I can tell you this. In our Heavenly Father's home, Obedience is an expectation to every child he receives. Amen. No one is an exception. Every one of them is expected to obey. Obedience is to be expected in our Father's, Heavenly Father's household. It's, notice, notice how that looks. He says, not fashioning yourselves. I, I wrote the words down. Not forming yourself. Not giving shape to, fitting or adapting to what? To the former lust that you did in your ignorance. I wrote some of those sinful desires. Uncontrolled appetites. Forbidden activities. Sensual impulses. Selfish mot motivations. All of these collectively work because the old nature hasn't just disappeared. They collectively work to mold and pattern and fashion us, as I said this morning, to the world. To be like the world. Not like Jesus Christ. And we may not have known better when we were lost. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you right now, you know better now that you're saved. I remember newly saved, my Bible teacher, Bill Overway, Monday night, was teaching at the Servicemen Center Outreach. Just to show you how the Holy Spirit of God works. And I'd only been saved for a few weeks. And following the Monday night, night lesson, I came up to Brother Bill and I said, You mean to tell me, Brother Bill? Then when I go home on leave here in a few months, I can't have a beer with my twin brother, Doug. 
I asked that question. I'll never forget what he did. He goes, Brother Dave, I wasn't even teaching on that. The Holy Spirit of God took a principle of holiness, put his finger on an activity, and said, that's not clean, that's unclean. This buds for you is not what a Christian should be saying. Amen? And he just put his finger on that. And I, I, as he said that, I went, you're right, you never did. Where did I get that from? Well, that's the Spirit of God in me. He's the Holy Spirit, amen? And he's nudging me to obedience. And now that I'm saved, I do know better. I maybe didn't when I was lost, but I do now. This world has a gravitational pull. Could I get an amen there? It is. It just pulls. And if we do not strive against sin, and purpose to focus on spiritual things rather than carnal things, automatically will inexorably be pulled into unholiness and worldliness. The first thing to recognize as you and I look at this command to grow up, obedience is to be expected. It should never be optional. But second of all, holiness is intentional. Write that down. It is not accidental. Holiness is an act of your will. It's intentional. It's not accidental. You, you know, you and I, because of the world that's, that's drawing and Satan that's whispering and the carnal appetites that are begging, all collectively working, you and I need to recognize we have to strive against sin. Don't go with the flow. It's not a good flow. Dead things float downstream. You're not dead. You're alive in Jesus Christ. You have to fight these things that are out there, all the poles of this world. Don't, don't think for a minute you're exempt. Don't think for one second your children don't have those tuggings in their life. Amen? Recognize that. You have to fight against it. You have to strive against sin. The command is to gird up. The command is to look up. And the command is to grow up. I don't know if you know who Robert Murray McShane was, quite a godly young man. He was born in 1813 in Edinburgh, Scotland. And he was saved at the age of 23. He only lived six years as a saved man, died at 29. But his life was a life so preoccupied with the grace of God, the Word of God, the holiness of God, that over 7,000 attended his funeral in just after six years of influence, dying a young man. Here's what he wrote. Quote, Remember, Christian, you are God's sword and God's instrument, a chosen vessel to bear his name. In great measure, according to the purity of the instrument, will be its success. It is not great talents that God blesses, so much as great likeness to Jesus Christ. A holy Christian is an awesome weapon in the hand of God. Talents come and go, but a Christ-like walk is available to every single one of us. Amen? So he challenged us, thirdly, to grow up. But then finally, I want you to go ahead and and look at this final, final command. Notice, and I wrote it down in the notes, not simply grow up, but finally step up. Look at what he says here in verse 15. Let's go back and just pick verse 13 again and just read it in the flow. He says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children... Not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy, he says, for I am holy. He says, gird up, look up, grow up. Then he says this, step up. Step up to what? You know what he's literally saying here? Christian, get serious about your calling. Get serious about your calling. You say, well, what is my calling? Look at verse 15. But as he which hath called you is holiness is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Go with me to 1 Thessalonians 4. Look at the calling that every Christian has. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, look with me here in verse number 7. 
This is very powerful. As I close these thoughts, it's not a long message. I'm going to make up for this morning's time. All right? But this is a good thought. This is something we need to hear. Step up to the calling that God has on your life now that you're saved. Look at what's said here in verse 7 of 1 Thessalonians 4. He says, for God, he's talking to believers now. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto, say the word with me, holiness. Do you know every believer has a calling from God? A lot of times we hear that calling from God. And you know what? We, we, we say, well, that's a pastor. A pastor gets a calling up from God. You know, a, a, a missionary, he's called of God. You know, that's his calling. Evangelist has a calling upon his life. Let me tell you, every one of us that names the name of Jesus Christ has a calling on our life. And the calling is to be holy. You and I are called unto holiness. This calling, number one, is comprehensive. Notice what he says in verse number 15. He says, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in how much of our conversation? What's the word? All, all manner of conversation. This, this calling upon every believer to live a holy life, first of all, is comprehensive. It, it, it's it covers all of our conversation. That's not just the way we talk, but the way we live. You know, you and I as believers don't just have a church language and then a work language. You know, you know what I'm saying? No, no, no. This is a comprehensive call. This affects you on Monday as well as Sunday. It's just not limited to when you're here. It's limited when you're out in the workplace working with the boys, guys. You with me? You know, you, you, don't, you don't tell dirty jokes here. You don't tell dirty jokes there. You wouldn't listen to dirty jokes here. You wouldn't listen to dirty jokes there. Y'all with me? It's comprehensive. I found that Christ invades my vocabulary. He invaded mine before I got saved or after I got saved. I remember that. I don't know what it is about us little guys, but we just got the filthiest mouths. Oh, man, I was filth. You would have hated being with me. The only time I could clean it up was when Grandma walked in. And even then I'd slip. I mean, I, I look back and it's like shameful. And then I get saved and I'm out there working on the jets with the Marine Corps. I'm all by myself. No one's around me running a speed handle off a, a tail ray dome. I'm going to take about 2,700 screws out of this silly thing, you know. And I'm working that speed. I was like, wham, man, that thing hit me aside the head. And, man, I let out a curse like I always did when I was lost. And no sooner I do that, my heart was just crushed. No one heard me. It's like, whoa. And right there in that hangar, 13 jets all around. He watched a young Marine just get on his knees and ask God to forgive him for doing that. I mean, wow, what was that all about? It's a comprehensive call. No one heard but God, but that was enough. Against thee, thee only have I sinned, David said. Well, David, you sinned against Bathsheba. You sinned against her family. You sinned against your eyes. As far as David was concerned, the one that he let down more than anybody else was his God. Everybody else paled in comparison. This call to holiness is comprehensive. It's all manner of conversation. And our passionate preoccupation is Jesus Christ and to be like him, Christ's likeness. Justin, a second century philosopher, He's oftentimes referred to as Justin the Martyr. And theologically, I don't know where that guy stood completely. I, I've researched him. I've tried to figure out an interesting testimony. It looks like he may have gotten, gotten saved. And then this one church venerated him. And it's like, I have no idea. That's not the purpose of the illustration. The purpose of the illustration is this. He wrote to the emperor of Rome. And he challenged that emperor to consider two things to validate the claims of Christianity. In other words, to prove that Christianity was real, number one, he challenged this pagan emperor to search out Scripture and to note the purity and veracity of the Word of God as a proof that Christianity was real. But then he challenged him to look at the purity and integrity of Christians. 
Wow. And he had this final say. He said this, because they are uniquely pure, then Christianity must be true. Can you imagine doing that today? Writing one of your politicians, one of your leaders that could care less about God, and they're out there, take your pick, they're out there. And just say, I want you to consider the claims of Christianity, of Jesus Christ. First, by searching Scripture to validate Jesus Christ's claim. But second of all, searching the lives of his followers to validate his claims as well. That their life is so pure, their life is so sweet, their life is so Christ-like, that this Jesus must be real. And you need him. I wonder, would we be those people living in such a way that we validate everything about our Savior's claims? He's holy. He's harmless. He's undefiled. I mean, would we be so much like him that a politician that hates Jesus Christ cannot, cannot look the other way? He must or she must note something different about those people. Wow. Our calling is comprehensive. And the purity and veracity of our Savior is oftentimes reflected by us in 1 Peter chapter 2. Just, just look with me just the next page over. Literally, <coughs> in verse number 11, he, he seems to in, infer this in 1 Peter 2, 11. He says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims. All right, he recognizes this isn't your home. You're just passing through and you're a stranger and a pilgrim. He said, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles. The Gentiles is that picture of non-believers. These are people that hate your God. He said, you be so honest and your conversation so honest, whereas they speak evil against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Wow. You know, you have people at work right now where you work. Your challenge should be you ought to search the scriptures, but you're willing. You're certainly allowed to search me, too. Amen. I want you to know Jesus changed my life so much. I welcome the inspection. Amen. And when you look, I hope you see Jesus Christ in me. I hope you see less of me and more of him. And then go to the scriptures and, and literally, you and I should be that byword that moves people to consider Christ. I mean, we're constantly the Bible that lost people read. Didn't we read that in Scripture? It says, you are our epistles, written in our hearts, known and read of all men. You know, lost people as a rule don't read their Bible. They read Christians. They try to figure out who our Savior is by how we live, how we act, how we deal with things, how we treat people. You're the only Bible they read. And I hope they get the right message. And that is Jesus does save and he is worth giving your life to. Amen. So this calling is, is comprehensive. It, it's all areas of your life. But then second of all, it not only is comprehensive, I wrote in the notes, it's not contemporary. It's, this calling is not contemporary. Notice what he says here in 1 Peter 1. This is interesting. As we're winding these thoughts down, he says uh, in verse 15, But as he which hath called you is holy, so be holy in all manner of conversation. Look at verse 16. Because it is written. He, he's referring back to Scripture. Be holy, for I am holy. You know where he's quoting from? The book of Leviticus. Written thousands, thousands of years earlier. This is what he's quoting. And the book of Leviticus, what an interesting book. In Leviticus 11, verse 44 and 45, is what he's quoting right there. You know, this call to be holy isn't something new. It's been around all the way back then. Amen? And, and Leviticus, Leviticus records the word holy more than any other book in your Bible. And that core command is repeated here by Peter in 1 Peter chapter 1. As he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy. And what does that mean? Be pure and be different. When we use the word holy matrimony, what does that mean? Different. This union is different than a shack job. 
It's holy. It's different. That's what the word holy means. Not only pure, but also different. And I want to just say today, pure is different. Amen? This call to holiness for you and me, it's... It is comprehensive, but it's not contemporary. It's, some, it's not something new. But thirdly, as we close, it's not something you create. It's not something you create. It's someone to whom you conform. All right? It's not something you can create. This, this holiness, this comprehensive, pure holy, all manner of conversation, lifestyle. It's not something you create. It's actually someone you conform to. We saw that this morning in Romans, Romans 8, verse 29. You and I have been predestinated to be, what's the word? Conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. How? By the transforming of your mind. There it is. Back to the mind again. Back to the gird up. Isn't that interesting? I wrote this down. Conformity to Christ is a contact event. Amen? You've got to spend time with him if you want to be like him. Isn't that profound? You ever watch older people as they get... Uh, well, I'm one of them now. But anyhow, as they, as they go on in years, you go, wow! Man, look at it. They act the same. They have the same little quirks, the same little innuendos, you know. It's... Wow, how'd that happen? Just spent a lot of time together. Amen? Amen? Let me tell you something. If you want to become godly, be like God, you must spend time with Jesus Christ. You must spend time with a holy father if you want to be a holy child. You with me? It's a contact event. Whoever you spend time with is who you ultimately become. You remember the, the disciples in Acts 4? Remember the enemies of the Lord? Acts 4, 12, Neither is there salvation in any other they boldly preached. For there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And then when their enemies saw the boldness of these men, they marveled and they took knowledge that they had been with Jesus. You and I have got to step back from the world. I'm not saying we don't have... You know, things will do from time to time, but it's not what we live for. We live to spend time with Him. Amen? Yeah. If you want to be holy, you'll have to spend time with a holy Savior. It's not something you can create. It's not. It's what He creates through you. He rubs off on you. Amen? Yeah. yeah. You have to separate yourself. It's not accidental. The holy life is purposeful, spending time with Jesus Christ. You know, as we wind these thoughts down tonight, I see the unmistakable command to be holy, for our Father is holy, to be like Him, to be like His Son, and it is a good thought. What would Jesus do? What I find interesting is Mahatma Gandhi once said this, He said, I would be a Christian, he said, if it wouldn't be for Christians. You have the most amazing Savior, but none of you live like him. Wow. I think sometimes we're so enamored with orthodoxy, you know, the organized Here's what I believe. We forget the orthopraxy, which is how you live. Because how you live is ultimately what you believe. Amen? And so let's go back, read these, and we'll close tonight. We see this unmistakable command. Look in verse 13 of 1 Peter 1. He says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and hope to the end for the graces we brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Gird up 
look up, grow up, step up. Step up to this high calling to be Christ-like, to live a godly life in this present evil world. It's an unmistakable command. Let's bow our hearts before the Lord tonight. His heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Here's how you apply a message like this. Here's how you apply a message like this. You apply it to what I call the big three. Number one, attitudes. Number one, your attitudes. Anger, lust, bitterness, worry. These are attitudes. These are attitudes. Heads bowed, eyes closed for just a moment. As I go through this, you say this call to holiness, first of all, should affect your attitudes. But second of all, it should influence your activities. It should influence your activities. There, there's just some activities Christians shouldn't be involved in. And then thirdly, it should influence your associations. I, I know that we're in the world, but we should not be of this world. I know every day we go out into that world, and, and like a ship, we're out there in the water of the world. And that, that's part of life. How else do you deal with people? You can't be a monk and sit in a cave. But as my mentor once said, he said, there's no problem with a Christian, a believer being in the world. The problem is when that water gets in the ship, the world gets in the life. The ship goes to the water, but the water should never be in the ship. How are your associations? How's the hope chest of your heart? Is there something in your heart tonight that's not godly. Attitude, activity, association. Yield to the calling we got in your life. You've been called unto holiness. Father, we thank you tonight for this thought. And I pray you'd use it in our hearts. And Lord, you would search us and show us, try us and know us. And Father, help us to recognize that, Father, our our searching and your searching of us, we're not called to be like each other. Father, we're called to be like you. Our calling is to be like you and like your son, not each other. Help our focus to be Jesus Christ and help our focus to be you, Father. And Lord, may we yield to this unmistakable command and calling in our life to be holy because you're holy. We ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.